This is a presentation about the British colonization and rule of India during the 1700s. In 1757, Britain invaded parts of India and ruled it as their own. Their excuse was that the British were needed to save the people of India due to their inferior government and culture. The source above states that the people of India had been living in a tyrannical government and therefore hailed the British leaders. They needed to save India from its chaotic and barbaric culture. This is an example of white man's burden, one of the main factors of imperialism. They wanted the abundant natural resources from Bengal and therefore took over. They needed these resources to expand and industrialize England. They saw, them, they saw themselves as saviors, and as stated in the source above, the inhabitants of Bengal were inferior. Robert Clive, the leader of British rule to India, takes credit for Bengal's extravagance. This political cartoon shows the British hunting among the tigers. As labeled on the tiger, there was Indian disunity. The cause for this disunity was the differing opinions of government. Because India was not united, they were vulnerable to the expansion of the British East India Company. The British expanded all over the coast of India, which shows that their reasons for colonization were economically based. Because they settled along the coast and closer to China, ports were created to export their unrefined goods. The arrows pointing to the dark red represent Britain's earliest annexed areas of India, and the lighter red areas depict the areas of India that they were to conquer later on. Although the British ruled most of India, they only built infrastructure, advanced technology, or asserted rule when necessary, which led to a chaotic rule. This political cartoon shows that the Indians felt used in an unfair way by the British. They were being overtaken by the British and used for their natural resources and cheap labor. The quote above shows that when the British came, it made the Indians feel unwelcome and like outcasts in their own country, just because they had different customs than the British. The British never integrated into Indian society. They ruled as if they were above the Indians. Because of their direct rule, they remained as an outsider, simply ruling as if they were in Britain, rather than including the natives into government or economy. The picture above shows the discontent of um, the Indians working in the British military. Because of this, they attempted rebellion many times. The majority of the forces were made up of Hindu sepoys, a name for infantry men in the Bengal army. In addition to this, some of the Indian rulers also joined the fight due to the British, Indians, British India Company annexation of native states. Others joined for religious reasons or to destroy taxation systems or simply for looting. In 1857, Indian soldiers who worked for the East India Company, made up of sepoys, became disillusioned with a government which did not represent their interests. As a result of this, they rebelled because of the misrepresentation from the British rule. The acquisition of the taxpayers greatly benefited the company, as seen in the quote, which shows how people's fortunes were changed and the motives for conquering India. Clive himself benefited greatly from the acquisition of India. Opium farmers were worked as hard as possible, then the opium was processed and sent to the chests and sent in chests to primarily China. Opium was India's largest export and accounted for the British's second most profit off of the colony behind tax money. Due to the British's wish to imperialize, they formed a joint stock company with India which allowed for maritime trade in the Indian Ocean. The company was responsible for around half of the global trade including spices, tea, and silk and opium. As cotton was introduced, the demand in Britain grew and so did its value in production. Because of imports of calico cotton were cheap and demand was high, even the poorest of British citizens' demands could be met. This caused trouble for the local merchants and a ban was placed on the import of calico cotton in order to stabilize the economy 20 years later. In order to stabilize the economy, 20 years later the ban was lifted. Both Asia and Western Europe went up as Britain rapidly and aggressively industrialized. The raw resources exported from India and manufactured in England boosted mainly England as can be seen in the map. Though Asia's economy rose, it was not as significant in the graph indicate 
The graph includes China and other big countries of Asia, not just India. As demand increased, so did the exports of cotton from India, and so did Britain's economic growth as seen in the previous chart. You can see that from the time British imperial rule began to when it ended, their cotton imports from India rose. The profits went to a small portion of wealthy British rulers. The average Indian did not see any of the profits from their hard work. For 6.6, .6, the image above shows the causes of migration by giving a glimpse at working conditions that might have caused migration in the interconnected world. This source provides more glimpses of migration and furthermore the effects of migration, 6.7, and in the beginning, it states, as is evident of majorities of the migrants move within the state, i.e. move within the same districts or move to other districts of the same state, and our state migration in India is mainly from states having low agricultural productivities. Next, moving to 6.8, causation of the imperial age, the prompt chosen was the imperial age was caused in result to industrial capitalist practices that led to increased standards of living for some and increased availability availability of consumer goods for most. This source, the colon colonialization of the Indian economy, gives reasons as to why British India was such an important colony. The colonialization of the Indian economy under British rule must remain a theme of overriding importance. Here was the first, the classic capitalist power creating and transforming the largest colony in the world. Marx was greatly interested in this phenomenon and called attention to the roles of India as a source of primary accumulation of capital and as a market for the industries of the colonizing power. Furthermore, this primary source of England's work in India provides information about the amount of food produced along with the population and how they improved. More food is raised from the land than ever was raised before, but the population has increased at an even more rapid rate than the food supply. We are compelled to stand by and watch the pitiless operation of economic laws with force no man can stay. India produces each harvest more food than she consumes. She exported during the last five years an average of 23 million of food grains along, capable of feeding her whole population for 10 days or an additional 5.5 million people for the entire year. During the past five years, India has sold an average of under 8 million worth of food grains to other nations. This sum is rather more than equal to the balance of over 7 million sterling, which receives in cash for her exports after paying for her imports for the interest on money raised in England and for all home charges of the government. To the right, is a chart that provides the food supply of British India based on province and population number. Next, from the same source, laborers work to make changes that will let them lead better and longer lives. But the government should remember that in such enterprises, the undertaker risks his capital and the laborers must be content to risk their health. Hitherto, the one object of our labor transport laws has been to reduce the labor's risk at the cost of the capitalist. At a later period, I had to inquire into the whole operation and spirit of these. I came to two conclusions. First, that labor transport was practicable in Bengal, not only for special industries like tea, but on a great scale for agricultural settlements. Second, that if the system were to be reorganized on this new basis, government must legislate with an eye to the money risks of the capitalists as well as the health risks of the laborer. Finally, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights gave way to, the, to better living. As states from this source, the UN created in 1946 the United Nations Common on Commission on Human Rights, which was made up of 18 member states. The eight individuals were from Australia, Chile, China, France, Lebanon, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Also, since its founding, the United Nations' central principle has been to pr protection and furthering the human rights for men, women, and children with the universal meaning covering all. Finally, this is our work cited. Thank you for watching. I hope you now understand the colonial, British colonialization of India. Thank you.